the ocean race is another level. It is a magical race. Human story, a sports story, it's life. It's a great challenge, it's an adventure. It's the ultimate team test. 24-7. The ocean race is the pinnacle of crewed offshore sailing. It's a big competition with the best sailor. In the Olympics, it's the same. You become a big family. But the ocean race is another level, because there's this element to the ocean race that is also about survival. People have hit islands, lost masts, sunk. There are probably unlimited options and possibilities to achieve things with each other that you could never imagine. It's extreme. Extreme competition, extreme adventure. It's a big, big roller coaster of emotions. A leap into the unknown. This race creates quite of an addiction on sailors. You will discover your new limits. It is the ultimate challenge. Expect the unexpected. This is the ultimate ocean marathon since 1973, the 50th anniversary of the race. It has always pitted the sport's best sailors against each other in an expedition through the world's toughest waters. With no prize money on the line, sailors are rewarded with the adventure of a lifetime, testing their skills, endurance, determination, and mental strength racing for six months around the world in one of the most brutal sporting events of modern day. In this, the 14th edition, there are five teams challenging aboard the state-of-the-art super-fast foiling Imokas. There are two French teams, Holcim PRB and Biotherm, along with a French-German collaboration, Guio Environment Team Europe. Then there's Boris Herman's multinational team, Militia, and the American powerhouse 11th Hour Racing Team. In this edition, they will race 32,000 miles around the world to nine iconic cities reaching unimaginable speeds. The ocean race is the toughest team sport in the world. This is the race that never stops day or night. This is the ocean race 2022-23. Now, it's always a historical moment in any edition to have each team together for the first time. And we have sailors from all around the world. First of all, welcome you, everyone here. Uh, nice to see you all, especially uh, you guys. What this race um, is going to be remains to be seen a little bit. It's never happened before. So how exactly you go about building a team isn't totally clear. You know, you, you said that we've managed big teams in the past, but this is by far the biggest. 11th hour racing team skippered by ocean race veteran Charlie Enright. This team not only has a state-of-the-art boat, but they have been sailing together and preparing for the ocean race for well over a year. Everybody in our organization has worked really, really hard. Uh, over the course of this past year to make this ship just a little bit more reliable, um, a little bit more user-friendly. You know, these boats are they're, they're pretty complicated. You know, they can definitely be fragile. And once you have what you have, it's trying to get as much uh, uh, blood from the stone, I guess, as you possibly can. And uh, you know, hopefully we're approaching that sweet spot with our platform. Certainly it feels like we got a good group and we'll be able to handle whatever's good for us. Being part of an 11-hour racing team is um, it's an honor for me. <laughs> it's been great to be able to sail with them and we feel that we are actually the boat that other teams are looking into it to understand like how, how you know how reliable are they? How fast are they going? How much they can like keep pushing. Boats were handed to us last time and this time we had to make a lot of different decisions as a team that go into the success of the campaign. And uh, ultimately, we won't know whether or not we got those decisions right until we line up with everyone in Alicante. 
For 50 years, the ocean race has been sailed on various ocean racing yachts, from the Corinthian-style cruising yachts through to the professional purpose-built VO60s and VO70s, and most recently, the VO65, used in the two previous editions. In this edition, the VO65s will have the option to compete in legs one, six, and seven for a new trophy in the Ocean Race VO65 Sprint Cup. Whilst the Amokas and the five teams will sell every leg for the Ocean Race Honours. The Amoka is an ever-evolving prototype class, designed to be sailed single or double-handed, and will now take centre stage at the Ocean Race 2022-23. Famously steered by an autopilot, the Amokas are fierce foiling machines, and this is the first round the world race where they will be fully crewed. I think it will be exciting to see from these two worlds meeting together who will be the best. The ocean race and the Amoka class is really a match made in heaven, and to see them come together over the last three years has been uh, a journey for sure, but we're ending up in a good spot and we have a really competitive race on our hands. I think people are going to fall in love about Mocha because they are really fast, really different. Every boat has its own story. We can see Malizia and Biotherms, they are totally different design. Often compared to Formula One cars, these foiling monsters utilize sophisticated technology to optimize their speeds across a massive range of conditions, regularly exceeding the 30 knot mark with ease, the equivalent of 55 kilometers an hour. There is no doubt these boats will deliver the fastest average speeds in the ocean race history. Now it's gonna be a game of, you know, what's our boat most performant in and how can our strategy be changed by this? We are a very smaller team and you're going to drive probably 99.9% .9 on the autopilot. Mocha is not uh, really strong, so if you have a boat you are confident in, you can push it more. And see, it's really important. The technology in this boat, it's, it's next level. We are feeding the computer with our knowledge and all the tests we do to make it a, like a racing monster. The race is divided into seven legs. It starts with a sprint from Alicante, Spain to Cabo Verde. From there, it's down to the southern tip of Africa to Cape Town, which has been a regular host of the race. Next up is a record-breaking leg, the longest racing distance in the 50-year history of the race, 12,750 nautical miles, a one-month marathon through the Southern Ocean from Cape Town to Itajaí, Brazil. This leg is worth double points, so it's crucial for teams to get it right. After the stop in Brazil, the boats head north across the equator and up to Newport on the east coast of the United States. The boats return to Europe on another double points leg with a transatlantic crossing to Aarhus, Denmark, followed by a flyby in Kiel, Germany, en route to The Hague in the Netherlands, and finally into the Mediterranean with the grand finale, this offshore leg to Geneva, Italy. Learning the limits of their Emokas will be a key element for skippers this year, because whilst a full team of four might mean maximum power, pushing it over the limits is a very real possibility and would have catastrophic consequences. Guillot Environment Team Europe, skippered by Benjamin Dutro and Robert Staniak, have opted to use a boat that's been used in a few previous races since 2016. Here we are in the cockpit, so all the manoeuvre will be here. Probably two people just here to manage the sail, one people to sleep, probably me on board like a navigator to check the forecast, to check the map on all the elements. Here we have the pit, for example, if you want to tack or if you want to jive, you will manage the, the boat here, yeah. Through its considerable history, it's been proven to be a solid and reliable boat, but will it match up to the latest generation of Imokas? It was uh, with two very well-financed teams who kept optimizing this boat. It has done uh, a race around the globe. It has done multiple transatlantic races. I'm sure that we are missing probably a few percentage on performance. But by the end of the day, you have to finish all the legs and uh, you also have to sail well as a team, the boats, and uh, yeah, I'm more than happy with this boat. 
Nature has been integral to the ocean race since the first edition in 1973. The wind provides the power for the boats. The ocean is the racetrack. This is deteriorating fast. The ocean race, along with 11th Hour Racing Team, the founding partner of the Events Racing with Purpose Sustainability Programme, has proven itself as a world leader in the fight to protect and restore the ocean. I think it's incredibly important for us as sailors to uh, yeah, look after the ocean. It's our playground, it's our workplace, it's uh, you know, where we go every day to, to do what we love. With a public-facing One Blue Voice campaign to promote the ocean's rights, the five Emoka teams also operate with major sustainability goals. 11th Hour Racing Team has driven innovation and change around sustainable boat building. Team Militia champion Climate Action parading their message, a race we must win. Holcim PRB are focusing on sustainable construction and circularity. Biotherm Racing, a beauty company dedicated to leading their industry in preserving and protecting the oceans. Guio Environment Team Europe are committed to solutions leading to zero landfill. We will work with, uh, with the ocean race to educate all the people we will meet during the Around the World. We are all focused on that. It's time to act, which is why the race is harnessing the unifying power of sports to drive change, starting with the Universal Declaration of Ocean Rights. The oceans are the, the base of all life on the planet. They absorb all the heat energy of climate change and one third of the man-made CO2, etc. So therefore we really very much support the, the Ocean Race Initiative. So it's not just a sailing race, it's a race to raise awareness of the risks we're taking with our ocean. It's a race to help protect our planet. It's a race against time. It's been 50 years since the first yacht set sail on the inaugural ocean race, then known as the Whitbread Round the World Race. However, Round the World Racing began much earlier than records suggest. The crews aboard the great clipper ships of the 19th century would race through all weather in an effort to beat their counterparts into ports around the world. It was in a pub in England that the idea of an official global race was crystallized those early pioneers forged ahead with the support of the Royal Navy and sponsor Whitbread. On the 8th of September 1973, 17 boats carrying 167 crew set sail from Portsmouth Harbour. It was a dream for us to, to discover the, how to do the around the world, uh, to go in the South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Cape Horn. It was maybe more than a race, it was uh, exploring. My father did the ocean race. The, the first one in 73, it was almost cruising boat. They had fridge on board, they had freezer. First wind well, nobody had any idea where he was going. Nobody else sailing race in this kind of oceans. When I was a kid, I was looking at this great footage and these pictures for me, it's one of the things that gave me the passion of uh, offshore sailing. In my room, in my hometown, I still have a big poster of like Hillbrook and Ericsson and Amersport too. And that's where, you know, especially with the first females racing around the world, it was like, okay, maybe, you know, it's something that is doable. For me, it was amazing because it was a mix of uh, sports, but also uh, adventure. Now I have the opportunity, I will do it on my favorite boat on Noni Moka and uh, we can challenge the ocean race legend, so it's perfect. In 50 years, 172 boats and more than 2,000 sailors have taken part in 13 editions of the event. Philip Poupon, Eric Tabali, and Sir Peter Blake, a few of them, luminaries of those early days of the ocean race, who pushed ocean racing to new levels and continue to inspire the new breed of sailor. Now we're, we're more athletes, I think, you know, we have to 
We have to consider the performance, we have to be good with electronics, we have to be almost a little bit engineers to be able to keep the systems running on the boat. We just did today the 90 degree test. We pulled the boat on its side and uh, that helps us to find out where exactly is the center of gravity of the boat. That means that the mast will go all the way down on the water, basically to test the, the stability of the boat. So if everything is correct, the boat will come upright again. <laughs> it's gone uh, pretty well so far. We have the, around the numbers that we were hoping for. So. Obviously, we hope not to see it in, uh, in that angle or position while we're actually sailing. Team Militia, skippered by Boris Herman, have opted for a design that includes a larger rear coach roof in another new evolution of the understanding of the class rules. We didn't build this boat to accommodate a team. We built a big coach roof to be more easily compliant with the class rules and to have an end plate effect for the wind under the boom of the mainsail. So the, the wind wouldn't easily go under the boom of the sail from one side to the other. And then, of course, we have head height. We can walk around between two rooms where we are fully protected. We have a lot of light coming in. Um, I think, yeah, that, that should make a big difference for what state the team will be in after like a cold transatlantic in April or May uh, towards the end of the race, uh, that will be when we will start seeing fatigue, I think. The record-breaking 12,750 nautical miles through the vast Southern Ocean is the greatest test the teams will face. Notoriously strong winds, relentless, unimaginable waves, well known to reach 20 meters. You know, it's a it's an endless cycle. There's there's no land for for the kind of southern ocean storms to be blocked by. So these storms can just cycle round and round, and the waves can just build up more and more. It's a massive test for the boat, uh, for the crew. Uh, you know, we're all good with each other now. But uh, let's see uh, if in, <laughs> in 14 days. On this lake, sailors will find themselves closer to the International Space Station than land. You're alone. You're, you're, you're very alone. It's here that five competitors have lost their lives. If you fall overboard, you're dead. But you shouldn't. Although Imoka teams will be protected under a coach roof for most of this year, they will have to be careful with just how hard they push their boats. Preparation is key, and having won the ocean race once before as a crew member, Kevin is back for the 14th edition as skipper of Holcim PRB. I'm very happy to come back with my own boat, my own crew, my own project, with all, all the team Holcim PRB. It's a very uh, short uh, timeline. I'm not concerned about it because we are very competent people and we will work hard. The boat was designed by French naval architect Guillaume Verdier and constructed at the Carrington Yards in Southampton, England. I decided to put two pedestals in order to be able to see the sails windward or uh, leeward. So that's why we've got a very flat and very low canopy, what we, we call it the canopy, in order to, to do a plate under the mainsail and also to have as less drag as possible. You want to be able to be, you know, to be comfortable. You see, you see at the back the other boats uh, for all ocean rise. Uh, you see forward the waves, uh, the waves coming. You can see from here the, the the sails. You may sit here and being able to trim. You trim. You've got the keel that is here, so you're able to adjust uh, the the power you want with with the keel. You've got automatic pilot that is here. And for full crew, you're able to join, to, to, to couple the two pedestals to have more power to hoist a sail, to, for a tack, for a jibe or anything. So, and you've got all information right here. Paul Mayer, skipper of Biotherm Racing, cut his teeth on the Olympic sailing circuit and has completed multiple round-the-world races, where he won the 2018 Route de Rum and was the Imoka champion in 2021. Maya is considered one of the big guns. We just launched a boat, and uh, it's not really realistic to think about ocean race, but actually we will do it. 
The Biotherm boat is also a Verdier design and sister ship to Holcim PRB, but built in the Persico yard in Italy. We change the rudder system, we change the shape of the boat, and we, cha we change also the foils and foil case, so it's uh, like an evolution. The bow is designed to go through the wave and maybe it's a little bit more curved to avoid to put the nose in the, in the front wave and uh, probably helpful for the Southern Ocean. Uh, on my old boat, during four years, I did one time 31 knots and this boat, I think the fifth sail, I did 37.5. When I, I'm trimming the sail, I can just check with this window uh, in front to uh, if it's a good, uh, good trimming and good curve. The boat is really done, but it's moving a lot, so you are always like this, so it's not a problem. And most of the time you sit or you move on the knee, so it's not a problem. It's quite easy to ease and, uh, and trim the sails from here or from here or from downwind. So, uh, no, I, I think it's a good idea, but uh, we have to try it. <laughs> We are a little bit late, but every five boats have a different opportunity to, to perform on the race. In the last race in 2017-18, after 44,000 miles of racing, it all came down to the last leg and the last few miles, and one major decision. Since we started the leg, we knew we wanted to pass inside. For us, it was obvious we were so close. We were all together, the free boat, and we were surprised that nobody came with us. So it was only half an hour to go to the fashion climb, and I say, is it going to happen? What's going to happen? Yeah! At the end, we won. Starting in Alicante in January, finishing in Geneva in July. Five Imoca teams, six months, seven legs, and a chance to win the ultimate prize. Will I win? I don't know. Can I? Yes. We've done the race twice before, and we're ready to go. I never said the race longer than the ocean race. The race is probably win in the organization, in the management, in the choice of the team. Who has still a good fresh mind in Aarhus, in Kiel, to The Hague and to Genoa. But take care of your team. The team is the key. Follow the ocean race live and on demand on Discovery Plus and Eurosport. It's not only being uh, on the top of the podium. Sunset, sunrise. The camaraderie of sharing a beer in Cape Town. A wave. It's a big opportunity to discover many countries. The longest downwind I will ever race in my life. <laughs> what you're looking for is to be alive.